Hello everyone! Hey there! Welcome to another episode of Trash Talking. We're here to explore the latest updates about sustainability and recycling across Europe. Our goal is to bring valuable insights and advice to adopt a more sustainable lifestyle. So we will have expert guests that will join us to provide their knowledge and experience. We are your hosts, Carolina and, and Itziar. <laughs> And we are ready to dive into today's sustainability-related concept. We hope that Trash Talking will become your go-to source for enlightening discussions about the recent developments. As we always say, we will demonstrate that talking about sustainability is interesting and necessary. So get ready to start. This podcast is produced by The Primus Project, where 12 European organizations are working together to recycle plastic for car parts and home appliances. Each episode is about a different European country, And for today, we chose Belgium. Belgium! Hmm. So, ready to start? Yes, let's go ahead. Today, we will be talking about Belgium. And to have a first-hand experience about sustainability in this country, we invited a Primus partner, Mathilde Tabot. She works at Plastics Recyclers Europe as a regulatory affairs manager. Currently, she lives in Belgium, but she is actually French. Let's give her the chance to introduce herself. Welcome, Mathilde. Thank you for accepting this invitation. Well, hello both. Thank you very much for the invitation. So my name is Mathilde Tavo. I work at Plastics Recycler Europe as a regulatory affairs manager. So Plastic Recycler Europe, also called Pierre Eden is the industry association representing plastic recyclers at European level from the design until the end of life management. So what we are doing and our main goal is that we are striving to making plastic fully circular from the beginning till the end of the value chain. Other than that, um, on myself a little bit. So by training, I'm a chemical engineer. I'm specialized in material and processes. And before working at PRE, I used to work at a plastics recycling facility for WEEE Plastic in the Netherlands. So WEEE Plastics is the waste uh, from electrical and electronic equipment. And I was really dedicated to quality control and research and development. In my daily job, uh, so today in, uh, in Belgium at PRE, I'm responsible for the management of the different research projects, uh, both on European projects, but also internal projects linked to regulatory topics. And of course, I follow very closely the evolution of the chemicals legislation, because it's important to monitor this legislation in order to check the compliance of the recycled plastic with the legislation, which is also uh, a key point in my job. And as said before, so I've lived in, in really different country. Yeah? I've lived in Finland for my studies, then in Germany for internships, and then in the Netherlands, and now in Belgium. And I'm French, so I have traveled quite, uh, quite a lot. Thank you for your introduction. You've had an exciting journey, and we are very happy to have you in the podcast today. Yeah, okay, so now that we already did a short introduction, I think we can start with the first section where we will be talking about general facts of waste management in Belgium. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's start diving into sustainability in Belgium. According to the research we did to find relevant information about sustainability in Belgium, it seems that the country is doing pretty well with their waste management system. But like many other countries, it still faces its fair challenges. That's it. The country has a well-established waste management and recycling system, and it has also achieved a high recycling rate, with over 60% of household waste being recycled. That sounds promising. Mathilde, how is Belgium approaching waste management specifically? So I would say that Belgium has implemented a robust waste management system that includes recycling, of course, but also composting and end waste to energy facilities. The government has also introduced various uh, different waste sorting measures and also recycling incentives in order to 
encourage the citizen to properly separate their waste, which is at the beginning and really the basis of any type of waste management activities. And they have also focused on different regulation for businesses to also encourage responsible um, waste management practices. It's great to hear about how countries commit to sustainability with these initiatives. Yeah, absolutely. But I also believe that we should also be working to increase public awareness. So not only on the country level, but really on um, the public level and to ensure like really participation in sustainable practices, which is definitely an ongoing challenge in that regard. Yeah, I totally agree. And taking advantage that you are aware of current EU regulations, do you believe that the measures that are being adopted by the European Union are being effective and until what extent? Yes, so definitely there is many, many, many different regulations that are being drafted at European level to provide solution aiming at reducing and treating waste in what we call the best environmentally sound manner. So it means the best way to treat waste in order to protect the environment and the citizens. But because I don't have time in this podcast to go through all the different regulations that are ongoing at EU level, and I want to give you an example. And an example that can talk, let's say, um, to many people. So the EU is currently acting towards improving the collection system to promote a deposit return system for specific articles. This is already implemented in some member states, such as the water bottles. This way, we can actually collect a clean stream of bottles that is very important, that can go back into bottles and, of course, through a recycling process. This way, we really ensure that we have a clean stream from the very beginning of the value chain, which is very important. Yeah, good to know. It is important to push the limits from an EU level if we want to achieve significant change. Yeah, that's a key aspect, I think. Yeah. Now we would like to introduce you to a thought-provoking concept. The concept we will be discussing about is called degrowth. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you are all eager to learn about it. And even though some of you might not agree with it, it's good to know different points of view. We want to be objective and bring the most intriguing topics. So Carolina, would you like to start explaining what exactly is degrowth? Yes, I will try to put it in simple words because the term itself is pretty complex. The growth is a concept that challenges the traditional notion of economic growth as the primary driver of well-being and progress. It advocates for a reduction in economic production and consumption as a means to achieve sustainability, social equity, and improve quality mm -hmm. of life. Yeah. I personally find it very interesting to reflect on this degrowth concept. Mm -hmm. It's essentially suggesting that we should be moving away from the continuous pursuit of economic growth. And this idea has been gaining traction because many people are recognizing the environmental and social consequences of our current growth-oriented economic mm -hmm. model. Exactly. One of the key principles of degrowth is reducing resource use. Mm -hmm. So if we consume fewer natural resources and reduce waste, we will clearly decrease our ecological footprint. Yeah, and this should be applied after redefining success, mm -hmm. since degrowth suggests measuring success with a more global perspective, not only with GDP, but also other factors like well-being and environmental sustainability, for instance. A society practicing degrowth will have several key differences from the current growth-based model. It will prioritize our other aspects like sustainable consumption or local economy and resource conservation, for example. Mm -hmm. So, Mathilde, I wonder if you knew about this approach to growth. Yeah, I think I've actually heard of it before even though the term has not very been very extended yet. But it sounds like a radical shift in thinking, but it would be one that is increasingly necessary given the environmental challenges that we face. But I would like to ask maybe if there are like really some real world example of degrowth in action. 
As far as I know, there aren't many fully realized examples on a nation scale, even though there are some communities and movements around the world experimenting with degrowth principles. So I would say it's still an idea and a topic of discussion among activists, mm -hmm. policymakers and others. Yeah. Exactly. I would say that the main takeaway is that degrowth offers an alternative vision for a more sustainable and equitable future. It invites us to rethink our priorities beyond economic growth. It basically emphasizes the need to transition to a regenerative circular economy that minimizes environmental impacts and encourages sustainable practices. It may and should bring discussions about how we can build a more balanced society. I would definitely reflect on the concept and find some more information myself because I found it very interesting. I'm glad it inspired you and we will for sure keep learning about degrowth as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Right. Next, we are introducing a new concept, Plastic Overshoot Day. It is an amazing and pretty illustrative concept born from a research study developed by EA Environmental Action, which is a Switzerland-based team of sustainability leaders that are committed to provide knowledge to organizations and people in general to create sustainable change by developing strong science methodology and action plans. To explain the concept in the simplest way possible, mm -hmm. Plastic Overshoot Day marks the point in the year when we've used more plastic than the Earth can manage effectively and in a sustainable manner. It's impressive. Yeah. This year, in 2023, we reached the Global Overshoot Day on July 28th. Whoa. Half year. Apart from the global date, each country has its own Plastic Overshoot Day, which is also determined by the amount of plastic generated and the country's capacity to manage it. Mm -hmm. The concept highlights the growing problem of plastic pollution and overconsumption. Mm -hmm. In fact, it has been moving earlier and earlier in the year. Mathilde, regarding Belgium, which day do you think it is marked as Plastic Overshoot Day for the country? Well, that's, that's quite a difficult question, let's say, to guess. But I would say that considering that Belgium has quite some capacities in plastic recycling and many other ways to manage plastic waste. And relatively, I would say that it has been doing pretty well in terms of sustainability related topics. So I would be optimistic and say that the overshoot day is marked quite late in the calendar. Maybe I would say around November or December, am I right? Yes, you are. In the case of Belgium, Plastic Overshoot Day is marked on December 11th. Hmm. It's a country with one of the latest overshoot days in this year's calendars. Hmm. There are others marked even at the beginning of January, but we will get into that in a while. Mm -hmm. France, for example, has its overshoot day on December the 13th, almost like Belgium. The environmental action team has analyzed and processed all the information and have created some country archetypes. The archetypes englobe a group of countries with similar characteristics in order to offer certain strategies that countries could follow to have a more efficient approach, reduce overall plastic waste and mitigate mismanaged plastic, prolonging the country's overshoot day. There are in total 10 archetypes that represent countries based on the amount of plastic they produce and use, how well it is managed, waste export and import numbers. Mm -hmm. Among others, Belgium is included in the archetype called the transactors. <laughs> These are countries with very high rates of plastic consumption and use. However, their waste seems to be well managed, yeah. even though most haven't implemented extensive circular systems yet. These are wealthy countries that export a lot of their waste, but also import waste from other countries, and they have managed to optimize their management practices. Mm -hmm. One important recommendation that EA gives to countries included in the transactors archetype is to reduce plastic production and use. And as a high consumption country, reducing plastic consumption is critical for them. And in that way, their existing infrastructure for waste management could help others who currently lack of that capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess maybe another recommendation would be to definitely transition to a more circular system. 
Uh, still nowadays, in, in wealthy and developed countries, plastic waste follows a linear path, so mainly the take, make and dispose uh, actions. An effective solution in that case must be based on circularity, but also even if I'm like really proning for plastic recycling, before this, we should also take into consideration that we should reuse, we should also repair, and most importantly, we should reduce. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that's a must. So we have already described plastic overshoot day and had an overview about Belgium situation. Yes, so we can keep going with the next section. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. We always bring an innovative sustainable initiative creating in the country dedicated to the episode. And today it won't be different. Of course not. It is hard to find an original project that will surprise and inspire you and us, but we tried. So we have already brought a bunch of initiatives to the mm -hmm. podcast, but don't worry because we haven't run out of ideas yet. Mm -hmm. We have seen that each country's efforts focus on different sectors sometimes, mm -hmm. so we try to have some variety. Carolina, would you like to start telling the listeners what we have for today? Yep. Today we brought a great initiative. It's a Belgium-based company called Resortex. And it's about sustainable fashion. I love it. Yes, exactly. Fashion generates over 1.2 billion tons of CO2 every year. To make it a bit easier to understand, it translates into wasting every second one truck full of textiles across the globe. Which is incredible. Mm -hmm. Their goal is to promote circularity in the textile and fashion industry, making recycling easy through innovative design for disassembly technology. Let's explain how it works. Resortex has developed smart stitch and smart disassembly technologies. Garments can be sewed and stitched with their development, which are heat dissolvable threads, and therefore clothes can be disassembled on an industrial scale thanks to smart disassembly machinery. Mm -hmm. So they're low emissions thermal disassembly systems. So basically, use a specific threads to sew the clothing pieces and a specific machinery to melt them. Then the garments will be disassembled. Pretty simple, right? Yeah. So the sustainable innovation combined make it possible to recover up to 90% of clothing fabric, supporting brands from the fashion industry to transition to a circular production. Mm -hmm. I personally love this concept mm -hmm. and companies that work towards a sustainable fashion industry. We have learned in previous episodes that the recycling part is a must for circularity mm -hmm. and actually they make it very easy. Yes, recycling is definitely a must. But I guess one of the biggest challenges is collecting all those closing pieces suit with research text technology in order to recycle them afterwards. Yeah, probably yes. We've mentioned before in the podcast the challenge it supposes to collect the waste and recyclables. Mm -hmm. But still great work from research text. Yeah, yeah, great idea. Check their website and social media if you are interested in learning more. We can't finish the episode without talking about sustainable habits that we believe you can implement in your everyday lives. Mm -hmm. First, we would like to ask Mathilde a question. Hope you don't find it too difficult to answer. Hopefully not. What's the biggest change that you have made in your life that was only for sustainability reasons? So here, I would say that it's not necessarily about one big change, but rather about the accumulation of small changes that makes a significant impact in the end. So if I give you an example, I did not change my life radically, let's say, but I try to go to work by bike or I try to eat meat not more than once a week. I also try to avoid taking the plane. I sort my waste, of course, this is the basis. And as you, I use as less single-use item as possible. So I try to do a lot of little things that in the end potentially can make a bigger change. Uh, I also try to buy less and more sustainable clothes, which is uh, clothes is quite, um, let's say, an interesting um, hobby for me. So this is also something that I try. And then I think that everyone could implement a small change at their own scale. So of course, it's different for everyone, but that in the end could result in a big change. 
Yeah, you are absolutely right. I wish we could extend a bit these good habits to more people because it would create a significant change. Apart from that, could you tell us how you contribute to sustainability, both in your professional and personal side? So Plastics Recycle Europe is um, dedicated to making plastic circular, as I said at the beginning, so really from the design of the article until its end-of-life management. Then the recycled plastic that has been produced, also called recyclates, uh, must be integrated into a new article. So it's very important to get the full picture and look at every step of the value chain to ensure circularity, because every step will really have an impact into the end of life afterwards. As we have seen before, the collections plays really a big role into the waste management. This is why every citizen that have access to the collection systems in their country should really sort at home their waste to ensure they get a second life afterwards. We hear very often, uh, and I hear it as well, some misconception that sorting at home might not be necessary, but actually it's, quite the opposite. Uh, it strongly influences the quality of the waste and the quality of the waste strongly influence the quality of the recycled plastic afterwards. So this is really a key takeaway from this talk. Sorting at home is of very high importance. Well, you contribute a lot to sustainability from your professional side and of course even more to plastic recycling. So also thank you for reminding the listeners the importance of separating the waste correctly. Mm -hmm. I have heard more than once that it is not necessary because the waste is mixed and everything goes to the same place, but we have seen this is not true. Yeah. As we wrap up our discussion, we will say that it's essential for Belgium to continue its effort and for citizens to be actively engaged in sustainable practices to create a greener future. Yeah, I totally agree. And thank you so much, Mathilde, for putting some light on Belgium's sustainability journey. It's clear that there is progress being made, but it's also important to keep pushing for more sustainable practices. Well, I would say thank you very much for inviting me. It's been great to create these spaces to discuss about sustainability, so it has been really been a pleasure. We hope this discussion has provided valuable insights for our listeners. Thank you for tuning in to Trash Talking and stay tuned for the next episode on important topics like this one. Yes, see you all in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Till next time. This podcast series is funded by the European Union. Views and opinions expressed are, however, those of the authors only and do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or Hadia. Neither the European Union nor the granting authority can be held responsible for them. <laughs>